torture, rendition, and the rebranding of the war on terror. We examine the fault lines in Barack Obama's emerging policies. And remembering the human cost, we meet one victim of the U.S. rendition policy and speak to him about his fight for justice. We live in a world run through with fault lines. As the global economy implodes, and people around the world feel the financial shockwave, as more US troops pour into Afghanistan, as Israel tightens its stranglehold on Palestine, all eyes are on the United States. And may God bless the United States of America. Al Jazeera's eyes are there, too. Fault lines will take you to the places where opposing forces collide. Every two weeks, we'll examine those conflicts, both in the U.S. and the rest of the world. From the heart of a superpower in crisis, Fault Lines digs deeper into what's driving the big stories of the day. There are lines of responsibility for the crises that the world faces. We'll follow them and ask tough questions of those at fault. We'll bring you stories from the street, too. Put a face on those who are falling through the cracks and give a platform to those who are fighting back. As powerful forces redraw the map of the United States and its place in the world, this show will go below the surface, tracing the fault lines wherever they lead. And no matter how dark it gets, we will always try to cast a little light. Welcome to the first edition of Fault Lines. As the clock ticks down to Barack Obama's 100th day in office, most of the scrutiny of the White House has focused, quite naturally, on its response to the evolving economic crisis. But what about the policies that Obama inherited on detention, rendition, and torture? What about the United States' so-called war on terror? Well, Hillary Clinton made headlines last month when she confirmed that the new administration no longer uses the term. She said that decision speaks for itself. But does it? Much less attention has been paid to a series of crucial court cases in which the Obama administration has fought to continue some of the most controversial practices of the Bush era. To learn more, I traveled the corridors of power from Washington to New York, speaking to people on all sides of the issue, tracing the fault lines of this fundamental debate. Because there is no force in the world more powerful than the example of America. I think they're going to see that some of their campaign rhetoric meets national security reality and we have to keep our country safe. I think people who think this is going to be a night and day difference between administrations are in for a, a rather upsetting reality. And that is why I have ordered the closing of the detention center at Guantanamo Bay and will seek swift and certain justice for captured terrorists. You closed down Guantanamo, is mission accomplished? I would say absolutely not. There's 18,000 other men being held in military prisons around the world and they have got no notion of due process, and they need to be reunited with the law. And that is why I can stand here tonight and say without exception or equivocation that the United States of America does not torture. There needs to be a, a more dramatic rejection. You know, some of those words uh, also came out of the mouth of President Bush. This government does not torture people. You know, I haven't been put out of business as a human rights lawyer. Ground Zero in Manhattan. A massive crime scene invoked again and again since 2001 to justify three wars. Afghanistan, Iraq, and the transformative concept of a global war on terrorism. Today, new buildings are finally rising above the ground, emerging layer by layer in front of a constant crowd of onlookers. So too is the Obama administration's approach to the so-called war on terror. Rather than springing fully formed, it is an edifice under construction, with the whole world watching. It started with the stroke of a pen. Just days after taking office, Obama signed a series of executive orders banning torture, shutting down the CIA's network of secret prisons, 
and closing the U.S. detention center at Guantanamo Bay within a year. All right. Initially, these measures were cheered by the human rights community that had spent the Bush years fighting those very policies. But a few months into the new administration, the honeymoon is starting to fade. You know, an executive order is great, you know, but these concepts now are, you know, embedded in the architecture of uh, our laws, and they're not easily uh, dislodged. One example of that is extraordinary rendition, the U.S. practice of picking up terror suspects anywhere in the world and transporting them to third countries for interrogation. Obama's executive order insisted the U.S. would not transfer individuals to other nations to face torture. But on the very same day that was signed, administration officials made it clear that the rendition program would continue for the time being. Since then, Obama's Department of Justice has fought to dismiss lawsuits brought by alleged victims of rendition, arguing that they might expose state secrets and threaten national security. I'm quite disturbed to see that the Obama administration hasn't been able to free itself of that addiction to, uh, you know, uh, government secrecy in the, in the state secrets uh, cases that have come up where they've taken the same position that the Bush administration took. While rendition was one of the signal policies of the Bush administration, it actually started well before 9-11. That's no state secret. Its architect lives just a short drive outside of Washington, D.C. We're on our way to Virginia now to visit the home of Michael Scheuer. He's the former CIA official who designed the rendition program under President Bill Clinton. Hello, Hello. Mr. Scheuer. How, How are you? Lewis? Nice to meet you. A spy at home. <laughs> In his 22 years at the CIA, Michael Scheuer was a real company man. In two different periods, he was put in charge of the Osama bin Laden tracking unit. Since resigning from the agency, he's become a maverick, free from the constraints of diplomacy. America is far safer because of the rendition program, both under Mr. Clinton and under Mr. Bush. It's always very amusing, really, that when the rendition program is discussed in the media, it always begins on the day Mr. Bush was uh, inaugurated. And of course, the more brutal part of the rendition program was conducted under Mr. Clinton. Under you. Under me. But frankly, at this point, I'd rather kill him when we find him than to take him anywhere. But terrorism suspects are being taken somewhere to the prison at Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. There are thought to be some 600 prisoners there, many of them held for years without any legal process. But no one knows the details since lawyers and human rights groups are not allowed in. Will the Obama administration change these conditions? Not immediately. In fact, a Bush-era $60 million expansion of the prison is going ahead, expected to more than double its capacity. A key part of the fight to bring Bagram into the light of legal scrutiny is being waged from this quiet neighborhood in Queens, New York. You must be Tina. Great to meet you. Hi. Thanks for doing it. Tina Foster is the lawyer who litigated the first and only successful suit on behalf of prisoners detained at Bagram. The Obama administration, when given the opportunity to tell the court that it was rethinking its position on Bagram and that it wanted a chance to reconsider it, said, no, we don't need a chance. It looks to me so far like, uh, you know, we have Obama's Guantanamo at Bagram and we have Obama's Iraq and Afghanistan. That is certainly not what Obama campaigned on nor is it a spin that the administration would like to see stick. Obama promised to run the most transparent White House in history. Time to put that to the test. Now, obviously, we're eager to hear from the Obama administration itself on all of these issues. So we contacted the White House, the Pentagon, and the CIA, all of whom referred us to the Department of Justice, who told us that they'd be happy to tell us anything we'd like to know, but not on camera. So I'm going into the DOJ for a background briefing. No electronic devices whatsoever allowed. So I've got my trusty old school notebook. I'll take notes. Hey guys. The Justice Department official who briefed me said that the US would continue to invoke state secrets on rendition and any other issue it thinks necessary in the name of national security. On the rights of prisoners at Bagram to legal process, I was told simply that the new administration agrees with the old. In the Bush years, the government was slammed for denying terrorism suspects habeas corpus rights, the ability to challenge one's detention. Just seven months ago, the case against the Bush position was put passionately by this former constitutional law professor. So the point is, 
So the, so the reason that you have this principle is not to be soft on terrorism. It's because that's who we are. That's what we're protecting. Don't mock the Constitution. Don't make fun of it. Political decisions taken since have made a mockery of those beautiful words. In March, a federal district court judge sided with candidate Obama, granting habeas corpus rights to three Bagram prisoners. President Obama's administration continues to fight that ruling, moving quickly to file an appeal. But beneath all these specific legal questions is a much bigger one. Is the United States engaged in a global war on terror, as the Bush administration insisted? Once you accept the legal concept of a global battlefield, then the U.S. can detain people anywhere and apply the rules of war, like indefinite detention, rather than those of criminal justice, like due process. The Obama White House seems keen to distance itself from the warlike rhetoric of the Bush years. But if that concept of a global battlefield still underpins U.S. policy, then changing the words won't change the reality. You cannot argue that uh, the, there is a global war on terror that justifies the indefinite detention of anyone anywhere in the world. There is no difference between that and a dictatorship. In the midst of this debate, a major development. The leak of a report by the International Committee of the Red Cross that describes the treatment during the Bush years of 14 so-called high-value detainees at Guantanamo, including Abu Zubaydah and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. It describes in graphic detail the first-hand accounts of the prisoners themselves of the torture that they suffered, slamming across walls, waterboarding, a host of interrogation methods that by any legal definition of the term would constitute torture. Now that the very group charged with upholding the Geneva Conventions is on the record saying that the U.S. systematically violated those standards, how is official Washington taking it? I think everybody should understand that every Al-Qaeda operative is told if they're captured to claim torture. And uh, we have examined... But, but, many, with, but with respect, you, you've got the International Red Cross saying the, the United States tortured. The, the, the report that I saw was leaked contained reports by detainees, unverified, un, uncorroborated. Every Al-Qaeda operative is trained to allege torture. They allege it very well. They're schooled in it and the ICRC report apparently repeated those allegations. Despite these persistent denials, the ICRC label of torture has raised the stakes in the debate about accountability for possible war crimes in the Bush years. I wanted to take from someone who had served in Bush and Cheney's White House. Former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage agreed to meet me and submit to my gentler form of interrogation. Hi there. How do you do? Avi Lewis. Good afternoon. Nice, nice to, to see meet you. you. I've been wanting to uh, talk to you for a very long time, oh, great. actually. Well, we'll have, some fun this afternoon. <laughs> have a seat here. Did the United States torture people in, during the Bush administration? Uh, and these reports of waterboard uh, have been uh, acknowledged, and as far as I'm concerned, that's torture. You were in the administration at the time? Uh, yes, I was in the administration. You knew that there was waterboarding going on? No, I did not. If torture is against the law, well, and you say that the United States tortured, waterboarding specifically, that that's a crime and surely it should be prosecuted. You're, you're making, you're using terms like surely this and surely that. I have prefer the, the uh, formulation used by our president where he says that he's much more interested in reconciliation and correction of these problems. He wants to be a forward-looking man, and that's where I am. So if the truth, if there were a truth commission and it revealed that torture took place systematically by the Bush administration, then the truth should lead to some consequences. Well, I'm suggesting the consequences might be remedial rather than you're looking to throw someone in the who's cow. So the question is, if you don't think that a legal process is the, is the process, what process do you think should be well, followed? Well, you might go back to what was envisioned by the framers of the Constitution. It was called congressional oversight. Uh, this is their job. I don't think that uh, members of the Senate particularly want to look into these things, or they might have to look at themselves in the mirror. Where were they? Where were they? They're your representatives, too. They weren't here. They weren't doing their job. They were AWOL, absent without leave. While Richard Armitage insists that he knew nothing about torture at the time, he did tell me that he and Colin Powell, his boss at the State Department, lost a major battle within the administration over whether or not the Geneva Conventions applied to the so-called war on terror. 
So when you knew that the administration of which you were a part was departing from the Geneva Conventions and sidelining them, why didn't you quit? Uh, it, in hindsight, maybe I should have, but uh, you won in those positions. You see how many more battles will you have? You maybe fool yourself. You say, uh, well, how, many, how much worse would X, Y, or Z be if I weren't here? Perhaps the best way to assess the Obama administration's emerging policies is to take a step back. Maybe the devil is not in the details, but in the big picture. Rendition is still an option for the U.S. government. Bagram is still a legal limbo, with the administration fighting to keep it that way. And so far, there is no official process to bring to justice those who tortured or authorized torture under the U.S. flag. Barack Obama says he wants to restore America's standing in the world, but as his policies are tested in the courts and in the crucible of public debate, it's becoming clear that beautiful words will not be enough. Coming up after the break on Fault Lines. What happens when they get the wrong guy? Josh Rushing speaks to one victim of extraordinary rendition. Welcome back. Before the break, we saw the Obama administration, at least for now, intends to continue with a policy of extraordinary rendition, a policy that has seen foreign nationals picked up, delivered to a third country for interrogation, and even torture. It's important to look at the legal implications of that policy, but it's also vital to understand the human cost as well. And for that, we traveled to Canada. We meet a victim of U.S. extraordinary rendition, talked to him about his nightmare, and his continuing battle against the United States. Uh, I want people to understand that it's not just a year, okay? It's, it's a life-lasting experience. I still live with nightmares, I, uh, even though they decreased in intensity and, and frequency, but uh, it's, it's still there. You're, uh, my name has been tarnished. Meet Meher Arar, a telecom engineer, a Syrian-born Canadian citizen. His experience of extraordinary rendition is so well known, it inspired a Hollywood movie. A year after 9-11, on his way back from a family holiday in Tunisia, Arar was stopped at Kennedy Airport in New York, held in solitary confinement. The U.S. government suspected him of being a member of al-Qaeda and deported him, not to Canada as home, but to Syria. It was the beginning of 374 days of imprisonment. We now know that all this uh, started with the Canadian police sending uh, misleading and, and, and false information to their American counterparts. The RCMP, I became an interest for them because they saw me talking to someone uh, they were interested in. Did you realize the seriousness of what was happening when they, when they first pulled you aside? No, the first few hours, no, because they kept telling me they, they, uh, they only had some few questions to ask me about some individuals, but uh, even then I, I thought it would take a day or two, there was some kind of a mistake, you know. Until a week later when they presented me with a, a document claiming that I was a member of Al-Qaeda. I kept asking, asking for a lawyer, I kept asking to make a phone call to my family and they did not allow me. In fact, they told me, you are not an American citizen, you're not allowed a lawyer. Eventually, they relented. An immigration lawyer hired by his family did come to see Arar once, but she was never given the chance to help him. Instead, U.S. officials secreted him out in the middle of the night. They put him on a small plane and flew him to Jordan. From there, he was driven to Syria. They wanted to send me to Syria to be tortured. To be tortured to get information out of you? That's correct. What happened there? I was beaten with a cable. They would hit you on your open palms? Yes, with, like with, a school schoolboy, yeah. With a, a electric cable? Yes. I was kept in an underground cell that is the size of a coffin, I, I, a grave, six feet, uh, about three feet wide, six feet deep, and seven feet high, uh, for about 10 months and 10 days, underground in the darkness. Um, that alone was a form of torture. So did you learn some kind of mental routine? Like, how do you oh, it's get tough. through that much time alone? It's tough. For, the only thing you think about is your family, right? Uh, what happened to your wife? What happened to your kids? How, they, how are they surviving? Did it work though? Did they get information? Believe me, under torture, 
at the beginning you try to resist. As a human being, you try to resist as much as you can. And then eventually, when you see that the interrogator is only interested in hearing what he wants, just tell him what he wants to hear. What did you eventually end up they claiming? They said to me, uh, you have been to Afghanistan. So I was shocked. And have you ever been to Afghanistan? No. When you came back, you sued uh, the Canadian government and the U.S. government? That's correct. But the Canadian government officially exonerated you? That's, that's correct. And the government decided it, it was in their best interest to, to uh, settle the lawsuit. And the uh, part of that settlement, the Prime Minister apologized. Full exoneration and pardon by the Canadian government, but nothing from the country that carried out his rendition. And then your suit in the U.S., what happened with it? Well, the U.S. government has been putting obstacle after obstacle. Uh, my lawsuit was first dismissed in the federal court. We appealed. Uh, now, the Second Circuit Court, they, uh, the panel of three judges, they also sided with the government. Uh, two against one, but on their own, the judges actually decided to rehear the case. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, this uh, expanded panel uh, would, uh, would rule in my favor. They, uh, I think the Obama administration has come out and said they're going to close down Guantanamo Bay, that the U.S. does not participate in torture, but you don't see that as, a, as, an, as enough change? It's, I think it's, it's a good first step. Okay, but uh, I think what needs to happen is uh, the new administration has to not only uh, close Guantanamo, or they have to make sure that those people who were wronged are, 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 are compensated. They also need to make sure that those, those people who uh, were involved in torture are, are brought to justice. What I would like to do is I would like to draw the attention of the American people about the injustice that has been taking place. And one way of doing this is through the court system. If you give a message directly to the Obama administration, what, what would you say? There needs to be a commission that looks into those atrocities. Do, do you think torture is still going on under the Obama administration? I think it is still going on, yes. It seems Arar may be right, certainly at Guantanamo. Accusations have surfaced that guards have become even more aggressive since Barack Obama announced the closing of the prison. In fact, in the last few days, Al Jazeera received an unprecedented phone call from detainee inside Gitmo. Mohammed Al Karani says that recently, conditions at the camp have gotten worse. He told us that six hooded guards entered his cell. One smashed his head repeatedly into the floor so hard that it knocked a tooth out. Revelations like these bring home just how hard it is to close the door on this dark chapter in American history. On the next episode of Fault Lines, America's Economic Nightmare, I'm in my hometown, Lone Star, Texas, to look at the struggle for jobs. And the horror show that is the U.S. economy. Massive zombie banks bailed out families too poor to declare bankruptcy.